topic of this video is scriptures that mainstream Christians ignore faith or grace alone salvation why do mainstream Christians ignore these scriptures I would say it's because all these scriptures that I'm going to read through they all either explicitly or implicitly contradict the mainstream Christian doctrine like the reformed or Protestant doctrine of faith alone grace alone salvation and this is one of the favorite doctrines of the mainstream Christians that they will pound the table or the podium just over and over and over again and they just love to labor on it at the pulpit but I'm going to show from the scripture with very minimal commentary how these scriptures say that everyone not just unbelievers at the second uh, coming of Christ and the judgment day not just the unbelievers but everyone including the Christians will be judged based off their works and your salvation is based on that judgment of your works and one of the main like root issues that this all stems from is the English definition of believe or belief or faith the Greek word or words that are used for believing and belief and faith they have a uh, hidden meaning to them it implies obedience whereas in English we separate the idea of obedience from just faith and belief so that's why these reformed or Protestant or I just call them mainstream Christians because almost all Christians believe it except for like Catholics they say faith alone and what they mean by faith alone is they say that there's nothing that you do that affects your salvation and that as I will show is just wrong sorry but it's wrong and if you can have the patience to either just listen to me read through these maybe you can put it on 1.25 speed because I'm bad at reading so I'm sorry put it on like 1.25 speed or if you don't want to listen to me read through them you can go down to the description below and I have the whole list of scriptures there you can read through them on your own but if you made it this far through the video and you have the patience like I said to listen or read through this then thank you and I think you will be quite surprised so let's just get into the scripture now so this is Matthew chapter 3 verses 7 through 10 this is John the Baptist speaking when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism he said to them brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves we have Abraham as our father for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire so right here if your right eye causes you to sin gouge it out and throw it away for it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell and if your right hand causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away for it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell now I don't know if Jesus is being literal here but that sounds pretty extreme to prevent yourself from sinning chapter 6 verses 14 through 15 for if you forgive people their wrongdoing your heavenly father will forgive you as well but if you don't forgive people your father will not forgive your wrongdoing Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 27 not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my father in heaven on that day many will say to me Lord Lord didn't we prophesy in your name drive out demons in your name 
and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Other translations say, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house, and it collapsed, and its collapse was great. So, Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 through 37 right here in the middle I can tell you that on the day of judgment people will have to account for every careless word they speak for by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned chapter 16 verse 27 right here for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Chapter 18 of Matthew. This is a long one. Verses 21 through 35, because this is a parable. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said, I tell you, not as many as seven but seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents, which I think is like billions of dollars or something. One Bible translation points out. So 10,000 talents was brought before him. Just impossible amount to pay back. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion and released him and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. Don't know if I said that right. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay back what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed, and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed so my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. They have this titled, The Rich Young Ruler. Just then, someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life. What good must I do to have eternal life? I just want to stress that right there. Now, if, if Jesus was a good mainstream preacher, he would say, oh, no, you have this all wrong. It's not anything based off your works to have eternal life. You just have to have faith and my grace, and that's it. But let's... Let's see what Jesus says. Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. 
that is the exact opposite of what these mainstream preachers are saying. Jesus says, you want eternal life? Keep the commandments. Now he says, which ones? Let's clarify. Let's get specific. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard that command, he went away grieving, because he had many possessions. So right here, we have Jesus telling a man exactly what he should practice in order to obtain eternal life. Nothing about faith, nothing about grace here, actions. Sorry, there's another long one here because it's a parable. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Parable of the vineyard workers. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. To those men he said, You also go to my vineyard, and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon, and at three, he went out again, and did the same thing. Then about five, he went out and found others standing around, and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day, doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they said to him. You also go to my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, Call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what is yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my business? Are you jealous because I am so generous? Now, once again, I know this is a parable, so we can't take everything literally here, but I want to point out that these people are working, and they're getting a reward. What do we know, or what can we assume Jesus is talking about here with the reward? What do you think that reward is? I think it's eternal life, but these people are working for it. And I think a good reason to believe that the denarius in that parable is a parallel to eternal life is back right before that parable in chapter 19 Peter asks Jesus look we have left everything and followed you so what will there be for us Jesus said to them I assure you in the messianic age when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters, father or mother, children or fields because of my name, will receive one hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And notice that little phrase at the end, is what Jesus says here at the end of the parable. So that is why I think the denarius is equivalent to eternal life in this parable. Matthew chapter 21 verses 28 through 32. 
the parable of the two sons. But what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, My son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I don't want to. Yet later he changed his mind. Other translations say he regretted it and went. Then the man went to the other and said the same thing. I will, sir, he said, but he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? The first, they said. Jesus said to them, I assure you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him, but you, when you saw it, didn't even change your minds then and believe him. So once again, we have believing, in my opinion here, equivalent to doing. It was the son who actually did go out and work. He worked, did the will of his father, that is the one who is believing, paralleled between these two, the one who is believing in the way of righteousness. And they are entering the kingdom of God, the ones who do the will of the Father. Nothing about faith. Because this man said, I will. But he didn't actually go do it. Sorry, another long one here because it's another sort of parable. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't care for me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or without clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? Then he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Once again, it's all about actions what you do in life is what determines whether you get eternal life or not nothing about faith there now this one is more of implication you might think it's a stretch but I'm going to include it anyway this is Mark chapter 3 verses 33 through 35 this is when the people said oh you're mother and brothers are here to get you. He replied to them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who were sitting in a circle around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. 
So Mark chapter 9 verses 42 through 48. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes your downfall, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell. The unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's a reference to an Old Testament verse. I can't remember it. And if your foot causes your downfall, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell, the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 10 verses 17 through 22 and this is the same as one that we already saw but let's repeat it. As he was setting out on a journey a man ran up knelt down before him and asked him good teacher what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one, God. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was stunned at this demand, and he went away grieving, because he had many possessions. And then if you wanted to continue, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? But the disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astounded, saying to one another, Then who can be saved? This is drawing on something that was in Jewish culture at the time, where a lot of people believe that if you were rich, then that meant that God was pleased with you and was blessing you a bunch. And there's all throughout the New Testament, Jesus is flipping that idea on its head because the Pharisees were really wealthy and they had <clears throat> no pity for anyone who was poor. They didn't help the poor like at all. So he was constantly saying things like this to throw this in their face saying you're actually a sinner and God doesn't like you because you're being selfish but once again we have this example where Jesus tells a man what he must do do to inherit eternal life nothing about believing nothing about faith nothing about grace he tells you what you must practice. Luke chapter 3 verses 7 through 14 and this is very similar to one that we've already seen but it's got some extra added on to it. So John the Baptist is speaking. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him? Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance and don't start saying to yourselves we have Abraham as our father for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire what then should we do the crowds were asking him and he replied to them the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, 
and the one who has food must do the same. The tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? And he said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Just then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? he asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 48. The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge of his household's servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time? That slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and starts to beat the male and female slaves, and to eat and drink and get drunk, that slave's master will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him in pieces, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will, and didn't prepare himself or do it, will be severely beaten. But the one who did not know and did things deserving of blows will be beaten lightly. Much will be required of everyone who has been given much, and even more will be expected of those who have been entrusted with more. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. This is very similar to what we've seen already, but once again, here it is. A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. I have kept all these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. This is a, a little bit of a long one here. He, that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it, it began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. Because he's a tax collector. Everyone knows tax collectors are a bunch of cheats. And he's rich because of it. <clears throat> but Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus had told him, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. You see, Zacchaeus does exactly what Jesus had told the other rich man to do, but the other rich man couldn't do it. 
He loved his money too much. Didn't want to give it all away to the poor. And you see, Jesus says, Today salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus didn't profess, Oh yes, I believe. I have faith. No. He took action. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Sorry, it's another kind of long one here. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And everyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. John chapter 5 verses 24 through 29 I assure you anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment but has passed from death to life. I assure you an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out those who have done good things to the resurrection of life but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of judgment acts chapter 10 verses 34 and 35 then peter began to speak now i really understand that god doesn't show favoritism but in every nation the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. Acts chapter 26 verses 19 and 20 Therefore King Agrippa I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision instead I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 16. Sorry, this is a long one again. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognize that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment is revealed, he will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth, but are obeying unrighteousness. Affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew 
and also to the Greek. Therefore there is no favoritism with God. All those who sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all those who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. So, when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, instinctively do what the law demands, they are the law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts will either accuse or excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept secret according to my gospel through Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or any practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19 right here in the middle. Circumcision does not matter and uncircumcision does not matter but keeping God's commands does. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 58 Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep but we will all be changed in a moment in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed for this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal must be clothed with immortality when this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal is clothed with immortality then the saying that is written will take place death has been swallowed up in victory death where is your victory death where is your sting now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore my dear brothers be steadfast immovable always excelling in the Lord's work knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 for we, we must all appear before the tribunal of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body whether good or worthless Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 now the works of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality moral impurity promiscuity idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 don't be deceived God is not mocked for whatever a man sows he will also reap because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God but sexual immorality 
and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you, as is proper for saints. Coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For know and recognize this, every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 through 25 Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically, as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. 1 Timothy 6 verses 11 through 14 But you, man of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 through 19 instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth but on god who richly provides us with all things to enjoy instruct them to do what is good to be rich in good works to be generous willing to share storing up for themselves a good reserve for the age to come so that they may take hold of life that is real. Now the MLV from 2017 translate that as in order that they may grab the everlasting life. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 and 9 Though he, that's Jesus, was God's son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal life for all who obey him. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And I believe this is a bombshell. You probably have heard it before. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. For the demons also believe, and they shudder. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works faith was perfected. 
So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13-17 through 17. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And if you address as father the one who judges impartially based on each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your temporary residence. First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers, and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil, or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing, since you were called for this, so that you can inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to the request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we do not have any sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 2-6 through six. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. This is how we are sure that we have come to know him, by keeping his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, yet doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is perfected. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. Dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Now this is his command that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him. And 
the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands, says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do have this, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, or Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life which is in God's paradise. Revelation chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have affliction for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor will never be harmed by the second death. Revelation chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 but you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the victor will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades, or Sheol, as they say in the Old Testament, gave up their dead. All were judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Look, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to repay each person according to what he has done. Well, that's all the verses I have. There may be more out there. You maybe thought that some of the verses weren't very strong. Oh well, you can have your opinion. But I believe all of these verses mainstream preachers either just walk right over them without any thought or they avoid them completely because they explicitly contradict this whole faith alone grace alone dogma that they have now i will say sure there are verses out there that say we are saved through faith you know, we're saved by grace alone. And I agree. Yes, we are saved by the grace of God. But what's the difference between their grace alone and my grace alone, which is what I would consider the biblical grace alone belief? Is that it is by the grace of God that Jesus 
was made the Messiah by God and died to atone for our sins if we follow him. So this is why Jesus has been made the judge. When he comes back, he's going to judge everyone based off of their deeds. And if he thinks you are worthy of grace, he will show you grace, forgive you of your sins, and give you eternal life at the resurrection. But if he does not think you are worthy of forgiveness of sins because of your evil works, your evil deeds, he will destroy you in the lake of fire. That is how you can reconcile both. We are saved by grace and we are judged by our works. All of these mainstream Christians out there cannot reconcile both all these verses that I have mentioned or I've read through and the saved by grace because they go way too far on the grace side and say it doesn't matter what you do you're just forgiven it's all it's only grace alone you can't do anything to be saved well they are completely throwing out all of these scriptures that I just read through and saying they are wrong because a lot of these explicitly contradict what those mainstream Christians are saying. When you read those other scripture passages that I haven't gone through where it says we're saved by grace, they just take those at their own interpretation and ignore all these, whereas I believe that it is both. You are judged on your deeds and if it wasn't for the grace of God sending the Messiah to atone for our sins, we wouldn't have any chance of being resurrected to eternal life.